Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to all of you. My name is Muhammad Rizwan bin Ahmad and I'm going to be a mo mo moderator for today's uh, distinguished lecture sessions. For those who have lost counted how many of our distinguished lecture sessions so far, I'm very happy and also proud to inform you that this is our 61st distinguished lecture sessions. And today's sessions, I'm quite honored to uh, inform you that uh, our speaker today is uh, Professor Paolo uh, Dario from Pisa, Italy, uh, particularly from the university's uh, third missions uh, at the St. Anna School of Advanced uh, Studies, Pisa, Italy. So uh, our next uh, uh, session, I will uh, call our Dean of uh, Faculty of Engineering to uh, read the biographical uh, profile of our speaker. So uh, to you, Pro Prof. Uh, Dato uh, Rafiq. Uh, Rizwan, thank you so much for moderating the session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to our 61st UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Paolo Dario from Santana School of Advanced Studies, Pisa, Italy. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Paolo Dario is Professor of Biomedical Robotics and Pro-Rector for University's third mission at the Santana School of Advanced Studies, Pisa, Italy. He has been Founding Director of the Biorobotics Institute and Founding Coordinator of the PhD program in Biorobotics at the Santana School of Advanced Studies. He has been and is visiting researcher, professor, and fellow at various universities and scientific institutions in the Europe, USA, the Middle East, and Asia. His current research interests are in the field of biorobotics and bionics and include surgical robotics, micro nano devices for endoscopy, bio inspired devices and systems, and assistive and companion robots. Paolo Dario is the author of more than 400 journal publications. His H index is 64 in Scopus and 92 in Google. He is co-author of more than 50 international patents and co-founder of five startup companies. He has coordinated many large national and European projects and served in many EU committees. He is the founding editorial board member of the journal Science Robotics, associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Biomedical Engineering and editor-in-chief of the new IEEE Transactions on Medical Robotics and Bionics. Paolo Dario is an IEEE Fellow and a Fellow of the European Society on Medical and Biological Engineering. He served as President of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society and received several prizes and awards, including the 1996 Joseph Engelberger Award for Medical Robotics, the 2014 IEEE Robotics and Automation Society George Saridis Leadership Award, and the 2017 IEEE Robotics and Automation Society Pioneer Award for Biorobotics. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Paolo Dario from Santana School of Advanced Studies, Pisa, Italy, with his talk entitled Frontiers of Biorobotics and Bionics Science and Engineering. Professor Paolo Dario, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Thank you, Dr. Rafi. Thank you. Dr. Maud. Um, of course, it is uh, my great pleasure to uh, be with you and uh, to uh, talk about this uh, emerging area. I hope you can see my slides. Can you see my slides? Yeah, we can see your slide, Prof. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm talking about uh, an emerging uh, field, uh, actually uh, more than emerging now, because uh, biobotics and bionics 
have been uh, around uh, now for uh, decades uh, and uh, they are finding uh, a, a real role in science and engineering. And I would like to uh, share with you what this uh, really means. And I would like to start with uh, uh, some piece of uh, history by recalling, for example, uh, the case of uh, jobs that were considered as science fiction uh, a few decades ago, just 30 years ago, for example. Uh, but today, uh, being a, a, a medical roboticist uh, is uh, not a science fiction uh, job, but it's a real job. I'm sure here the case of uh, Dr. Catherine Moore, uh, uh, she is one of uh, the leading person at Intuitive Surgical, the manufacturer, very successful manufacturer of the Da Vinci surgical robot. So this is no longer a dream job, or if you will, is a dream job for our students. Uh, and it is a real job for real engineers. How did uh, all this start? Well, this started, if we can uh, uh, follow the evolution of uh, uh, biobotics and bionics as uh, today, and this is the topic of my, uh, of my lecture, um, everything started with the birth of modern robotics uh, in 1960. In the picture shown here, actually, you can see uh, Joseph Engelberg. I received uh, the Joseph Engelberg Prize for his, uh, from his own uh, hands. He passed away not so many years ago, but actually he is considered as the founder of modern robotics. And next to him is uh, Isaac Asimov, the, the, the writer, science fiction writer. This is a very nice combination of uh, science fiction and engineering, if you, if you will. Um, thanks to the integration between uh, mechanism and electronics, because robots are essentially mechatronic platform. In the 60s, what became uh, uh, then a very successful story about industrial robotics and then about services and uh, then also human robotics. No, they start around that time. Also, almost at the same time, um, uh, driven by uh, the Cold War, if you will, but also the scientific uh, uh, dream uh, and vision of taking inspiration from the biological world, the field of bionics uh, was uh, created. Um, and then there was uh, a tremendous interest in uh, what robotics uh, was, in the sense the synthesis between uh, uh, need and dream, uh, the synthesis between uh, engineering and uh, science, uh, the synthesis between technology and applications, and you see how different disciplines uh, uh, outside engineering, like biology, neuroscience, or inside engineering, like bioengineering is also uh, computer science, material science, uh, and other scientific areas, all those areas contributed to the re revitalization and growth of biorobotics, uh, but also the establishment uh, uh, with a new uh, framework of bionics. So that today we can talk about biorobotics and bionics, and there are many, many events essentially make all this uh, area uh, real and not only real, but also extremely promising for uh, research and uh, for application, including for industrial application. So it's a very nice picture that I like to share uh, with you. Um, uh, actually, uh, why I'm talking about science and engineering? Because there are many problems of design, primarily or exclusively, for scientific research. Here are two examples. Say, you know, the uh, MIT Mancuso was intended not in the beginning for rehabilitation, just to understand uh, better how the context, uh, the, the model uh, is uh, transmitting the intention of the, the uh, uh, arm and to uh, use this kind of robot because it will find any organ uh, is inspiring. Scientists uh, at MIT. Also, uh, human robots that are used uh, to 
understand really to uh, and simulate the growth of uh, um, abilities in children visual motor cognition, or the use of the robot and the robot developed by Rocky Iceberg weeks, uh, to uh, stimulate, uh, actually the model of the spinal cord that is at the basis of the evolution from swimming to walking, or the work that has been done by the colleagues of Azeda University about the humanoid, a user humanoid robot to understand essentially some pathologies of uh, locomotion or uh, the pretty famous uh, ICAB developed uh, at the University of Genova and then at the Italian Institute of Technology by uh, Giulio Sandini and Giorgio Menta. Or uh, this study of uh, uh, a worm like uh, Robot that can be used to understand the mechanism of locomotion in, uh, in uh, uh, worms, for example. So those robots are designed primarily for scientific research. But then, of course, there are many, many robots. Some of them are bio-robots. What, what does bio mean? So it means bio-inspiration and bio-application. And those bio-robots uh, uh, designed primarily for solving practical problems are uh, now ubiquitous. Those are examples from uh, my own institute. So robot companions, uh, robot for uh, assisting uh, 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 doctors uh, and uh, therapists in uh, neurodevelopmental uh, problems in children or prosthetics, or soft robots, or surgical robots, or uh, service robots, or endoscopy robots, or educational robots, married robots, and uh, mobile robots of many different kinds. So those robots are bio-applied. Uh, I discussed, uh, I briefly said that bionics uh, uh, was uh, uh, born, actually, in 1950, with a pretty historical and important meeting in which uh, at the Air Force Base in Dayton in the, the USA, and this meeting was important in science, essentially terms bionics was coined to indicate a lifelike system that copies some functions and characteristics of uh, a natural system. Actually, uh, the, the, the funding and research on bionics declined at the end of the 70s because of the overexposition of uh, uh, the term uh, due to TV series, you know, and so serious uh, funding agencies uh, decided not to fund uh, this, uh, um, this, this field. But then um, I myself, with colleagues like Giulio Sandini and, and Patrick Abisher, we sort of revamped uh, bionics by organizing a seminar in. Uh, 30 years ago, about uh, uh, towards a new bionics, so we called them like that. And, and many, many uh, people uh, to, to write how many uh, outstanding names participated in, in this workshop. And all together, we focused on different facets of what bionics is from artificial sensors to artificial to actuators to control to swarm behavior uh, and, and, and more. And uh, for example, here is a, is a case of a retina-like sensor that Julius and I developed uh, using a CCD technology. This is a retina-like, you know, is a um, is a is a retina-like shape of uh, of course taken from uh, the model of the uh, human retina with the phobia, and uh, this is just an example. But uh, olfaction, artificial olfaction, was introduced and many other areas. So today, uh, many bionic uh, systems are. Uh, in or close to clinical use, you can consider uh, the case of uh, tools, artificial ears, or some artificial uh, eyes, or we can consider uh, uh, new, new and emergent, actually uh, more and more popular 
hard, bionic hard, for example, fabricated using 3D technologies and uh, or even 4D, if you will, uh, meaning that uh, time is another very important factor using new materials and so new new uh, substitute of uh, uh, artificial organ like uh, bionic liver, bionic pancreas, and of course uh, also. Um, uh, artificial uh, limbs. Uh, here is the case uh, of a uh, very advanced uh, bionic prosthesis, uh, and, and people are using the prosthesis, and uh, they are even able to win dance contests, just showing the quality of, of uh, these legs. Uh, here I mentioned uh, the case of Luca, uh, who is a colleague at uh, MIT. Actually, he Call these extreme bionics, and they like to use this uh, uh, dream of the end of disability. You know, uh, uh, Professor Herr himself uh, uh, lost both uh, legs because uh, he was a climber and uh, he lost uh, legs because they uh, were frozen. But then he developed uh, a very advanced bionic prosthesis and now is able to uh, climb again. So those are many success stories about uh, bionic. So this is why we can um, make this uh, representation of what Biorobotics and bionics, the science and engineering are. If you uh, consider uh, the focus, you know, the focus is biological system. In fact, not only the biological world, uh, uh, the biological system themselves, so limbs, organs, and so on, but our ecosystem this is very important. Uh, we now there is a, a ubiquitous uh, awareness of how important is uh, our world, and so. Uh, also, the ecosystem is uh, an integral part of the story, an integral part of our um, analysis of the challenge we have. As engineers, we have a challenge for understanding, uh, replicating, augmenting, regenerating, uh, and taking care of not only people, but also the world in which people live. How do we do that? using our tools that are engineering analysis and modeling. When we do that, we can develop new design principles that can be used, for example, to develop new artificial organs, new senses, new limbs, but also for the development of medical robots, for human assistance, augmentation, including surgery and so on. So this area is predominantly the domain of engineering. But what we can do is also to develop a biomimetic robot. And these biomimetic robots, as the ones I have shown previously, uh, do not have an immediate application, but rather they can be used as tools for the experimental validation of these models. Or they can be used to develop bio-inspired robots, and this is again predominantly the domain of science. But this bio-inspired robot can also be used for applications. So you see how science and engineering are strictly connected. Actually, a very strong support the idea that good engineering should be. Uh, more and more based uh, on new scientific uh, understanding. So the connection between the discovery of science and uh, the invention of engineering are uh, very, very strong. They were always strong, but now and in the future will be stronger and stronger. You know, these ideas have been uh, uh, essentially brought to reality in recent years by uh, two journals, you know, I'm involved in both. Uh, one is Science Robotics. Uh, uh, many of you know that the impact factor of science robotics is the highest, in fact, uh, in the area of uh, robotics and, in fact, even of engineering, I believe, is 19.4. And uh, uh, the editorial of Science Robotics uh, is, uh, uh, is Science for Robotics and Robotics for Science. You know, this is uh, uh, the, the idea uh, behind that so is exactly in the sense of what I described in my CV 
his life. But also, I am the editor in chief of uh, the new anthropological transactions on medical robotics and bionics, in which, with the support of uh, the RAS and the EMBS societies, we are exploring uh, more the applications of. Uh, uh, robotics technology, bionic technology to, to the medical field. So, science and engineering, as you see, strictly connected. Now I'm going to share with you a few practical examples of what I mean and what, uh, or what I said uh, is, in fact. So, for example, uh, this is the field of, uh, uh, of, of uh, soft robotics. And another very interesting example of uh, curiosity-driven scientific discoveries to use about soft technology. So this is the work uh, of uh, predominant of my colleague, uh, Professor Cecilia Lasky, and uh, other colleagues. Uh, uh, and uh, essentially, the idea is uh, to try. You know, they were fascinated by the performance of the object. You know, there are some examples here that are really amazing. Essentially, um, and, and the question is, what are the principles that give the octopus its strength without rigid parts, on the ability to control infinite degrees of freedom with relatively small computing resources? And uh, this has been uh, uh, investigated also with the reference to a very important issue that was uh, underestimated in the past, still is, the role of uh, intelligence, of decentralized intelligence. You know, most of us are used to consider the brain and then the body, so most intelligence is in the brain and the rest, uh, you know, the body of most nothing. Actually, the article demonstrated that this may not to be entirely true because 65% of the neurons, if you will, so the intelligence is in the heart, not in the central brain. And uh, this brings uh, to a very, very important uh, new way of thinking about engineering, it is what is called uh, morphological computation. So, essentially, the role of shape, arrangement, material, mechanical properties can be extremely important. This was uh, suggested among the first of my professor of Pfeiffer and, and colleagues. But essentially, the idea is intelligence is in the body, not only in, uh, in the brain. And in fact, uh, this can be um, uh, uh, demonstrated or is something that uh, can be seen uh, in practice by, for example, developing an octopus arm with a, a very, very apparently, seemingly very uh, intelligent behavior, but I, I actually do just to the mechanical characteristics of uh, the object. And you see here how we have developed uh, many kinds of. Um, of, of artificial arms inspired by the octopus and essentially inspired by its uh, uh, mechanical property, the arrangement, you know, the morphology of uh, uh, the, the uh, octopus arm replicated and able to uh, demonstrate that this uh, can lead to intelligent or we can call it intelligent. This, uh, uh, accomplishment have been, uh, have been uh, uh, presented in a, in a very highly cited paper on science robotics uh, about this. Uh, but then, uh, what is important in the context of my talk is how soft robotics uh, go from a scientific understanding to engineering application. Here are some of that. For example, a real robot has been developed based or inspired by the property of the object. Here. 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 Even uh, and recently, for example, the use of uh, uh, this kind of uh, technologies, but uh, uh, scientific knowledge that then is translated into engineering design, 
for uh, a technology for assisting trained elders in uh, with, with a soft uh, behavior, for example, assisting. Uh, uh, frail elderly in pouring water, soaking, scrubbing, or uh, wiping. And this is uh, now tested in uh, uh, real frame. So essentially, soft robotics contributes to science uh, to develop new robotic abilities, like, for example, morphing, squeezing, the ability to taste to impact, self healing, or growing, like, for example, Plant-like, uh, plantoid robots. It's a work led by the Italian Institute of Technology. Fascinating uh, new era. That, in fact, uh, well matched uh, the uh, deeply and the strongly sensitive field. This thesis was able to demonstrate controlling uh, uh, compliance effects of uh, rock, uh, essentially a very effective and there are huge is on the intrinsic this or a string is in in robotics. And then other area of uh, uh, bionic technologies uh, like for example, and it was my dream in the early 80s is about developing the most advanced prosthesis in the world, uh, like in uh, Star Wars. At that time, this was uh, science fiction, but, but then uh, it became gradually an engineering project, you know, because it, 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 the, the problem is that a truly usable prosthetic hand uh, should include and possess highly tested behavior for sure, but also small size and weight, also sensing capabilities and the connection to the nervous system. Otherwise, it will not be a very, a really acceptable prosthetic hand. So what we did, you know, this is uh, the work that I started together with uh, Patrick Abisher and, and Angelo Melissa Bottini, who is now my colleague here. Patrick Abisher became uh, the president of uh, APFL, but at that time we worked together at Brown University and what we did was to develop uh, a new generation of implantable neural interfaces, you know, and then, working with other colleagues, so we developed uh, uh, skin-like sensors, okay? So connection and sensors. In order to uh, uh, devise what became uh, a concept of a, a cybernetic or bionic hand, in which you see, certainly, there is a mechanism with uh, multiple degrees of freedom, but there are sensors and uh, there are processors on board, and uh, mostly there are connections with neural electrodes to the peripheral nervous system. So, uh, what we have done uh, uh, together with uh, many colleagues is uh, uh, to develop uh, a new uh, concept, a new generation of Electro, some of them implantable, some like cuff, uh, uh, some intraneural, so many different solutions. Still, when we were able, uh, uh, here we'll piece of history what happened, and uh, so how we were able uh, to uh, uh, use these components and concept in prosthetics, but also in the robotics. And this is a, 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 a emotional video uh, showing how we were able in a real volunteer amputee with, uh, you see, you see the stump, and uh, actually he was, uh, uh, this guy, able to control with this top the movement of uh, this part. Essentially, he's controlling the movement of the 
uh, hand through is the peripheral uh, nerves, of course, the brain and the peripheral nerves connected to uh, an electron circuitry and then controlling the hand. It's a really a uh, uh, demonstration of the dream that then became uh, even uh, uh, closer to, to what we wanted to achieve uh, uh, by means of further work on electrons, more sophisticated. And then you see here, uh, actually, um, uh, this is uh, uh, most recent work uh, as uh, uh, my, my colleague, who was a former student, uh, uh, Professor Silvestro Pichera and many other colleagues essentially showing how the hand is uh, uh, what, in fact, not the sensors sending back signals to peripheral interfaces to the brain. So the amputee can perceive uh, the, the uh, prop, mechanical property. So this is uh, really a prosthetic hand because the person can not only control the hand, but also feel the uh, sensations of touch that are created at the periphery. And this is uh, the future. It's not the future, in fact. It's the present and uh, looking at the future. This is uh, the work of uh, Professor Grégoire Coutin at the PFL uh, in Switzerland. Uh, really being able to have a person with spinal cord injury, actually more than one, uh, regain uh, some level of uh, ability. So essentially, uh, we are, I mean, we as researchers at large are close to be able uh, to restore uh, walking capability, even in people with uh, spinal cord injuries. Of course, uh, this is a preliminary work, but it's uh, dramatic. You know, it's uh, again the, the, um, the materialization of. Uh, and the dream continue, of course, because uh, uh, there are other dreams, like, for example, uh, eradicating, eliminating colorectal cancer. That is extreme, it's a deadly threat. Deadly threat that can be cured if detected early. In order to detect, um, uh, and so to make uh, a, 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 a early diagnosis of, uh, of uh, contact, actually there is a colonoscopy, but colonoscopy is painful, it's quite often traumatic and, is, and poorly tolerated by patients. So what we were thinking, is to uh, in, in, in new devices like capsule endoscopy. I call this the adventure of capsule endoscopy because it's an intellectual dream. It's, uh, Isaac Asimov uh, uh, wrote a book uh, and then there was a movie called Fantastic Voyage. And so it's an adventure like uh, the development of, of an artificial hand uh, like uh, in the Star Wars movies. It's a similar uh, uh, the adventure of capsule endoscopy that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it, it is a dream, essentially, is a dream of uh, integrating in very, very small uh, structures, lots of functions, like the ones that were uh, conceived by surgeons uh, uh, almost 30 years ago, and um, which are uh, uh, sort of robot, in fact. That then became or is becoming reality. And I say great adventures and many heroes. And here is a non exhaustive list of many heroes who, who fought this uh, fight towards the development of a new generation of uh, uh, endoscopy systems. Uh, some of them were bio inspired. Uh, like warps. Here are pictures of some of my former students and colleagues who uh, helped to develop these uh, uh, devices. And some of them, in fact, uh, became uh, 
reality. This is a case of a startup company. So we started from a bio inspiration. We moved to engineering design. We made that in vitro in vivo. Then there was a phase of industrial design and then clinical application. Now, and this is real clinical application of a world like actually more than 3,000 patients in uh, uh, of this uh, uh, warm based uh, uh, painless colonoscopy system. But of course, the research goes on. This is a, a, a recent project funded by European Union that I coordinated, and uh, my colleague uh, Gastoni Trudi was uh, uh, my uh, main colleague, of course, now is a professor. And uh, we worked together about uh, the development, the development of this concept of uh, magnetic guided uh, um, uh, painless colonoscopy system. We are very close, also in this case, to make uh, um, uh, using, by the way, very very high quality uh, proprietary uh, cameras uh, and with a number of features about. Uh, image uh, uh, analysis, image processing to develop a system that can be, you see to the right uh, here, in fact, you see the scale 0 0.5 Newton versus 4 Newton of the force generated during colonoscopy by a traditional colonoscopy by uh, this capsule. So essentially, the idea of developing a painless system is uh, close to reality. Um, I try to go quickly towards the uh, conclusion of my uh, uh, lecture, but I'd like to uh, uh, look at the future about this, you know. Endoscopic capsule, of course, are primarily intended for imaging, but they may not do just uh, images, you know. They can do more. They, for example, can use it, and this is the work of uh, uh, the team of Daniela Rus at MIT. They can be ingestible, but they can be uh, uh, reconfigured, so fold and unfold like an origami device. This is a concept that uh, uh, Natasha Fukuda at Nagoya University, and also myself, uh, proposed uh, about uh, a reconfigurable surgical tool in uh, uh, the stomach. Example. And this, this uh, concept uh, has been and this still uh, very much explored by my colleagues. It's, it's very nice work uh, about the ingestible origami robot. But it, more, uh, I describe, you know, essentially bionics is about electronic, for example, artificial sense as well. An artificial nose uh, can be incorporated in uh, a ingestible capsule and, for example, to disseminate the colorectal carcinoma just by sensing, by sniffing colorectal cancer. This is well known actually, the recent recent well, not so recent actually, all the physicians know that patients with uh, cancer uh, emit or have a sort of uh, characteristic uh, smell. And uh, there are dogs, in fact, that can recognize pathologies in uh, people with cancer before cancer is uh, uh, actually detected. So this kind of technology can be extremely uh, promising, like uh, the domain of the microbiome. You know, we know that this layer of uh, bacteria, living cells, is a sort of uh, additional organs that we have in our gut. So we can explore the feature of this uh, microbiome is using dedicated capsule. And there is a new world to discover and uh, therapies to uh, prescribe to people uh, based on the feature of the, bi of the biome uh, in, in, in the human body. Or recently, a very uh, new uh, treatment in uh, post uh, by startup companies in the USA to treat, uh, to treat the diabetes too uh, by uh, removing the lining of the small intestine. You know, this was uh, uh, discovered almost by, uh, uh, by uh, understanding or, or noticing that bariatric surgery, so cutting part of the duodenum 
could uh, uh, eliminate the diabetes too. So it's another example of what uh, new treatment can be done by entering the human body. Or there are other uh, options, like a revolutionary technology. This is the work of, of my colleague, uh, Leonardo Conti, and uh, other uh, colleagues and co-workers. Essentially, the idea is to uh, refill an implanted uh, uh, artificial pancreas, in this case for diabetes 1, uh, predominantly, but just uh, by uh, swallowing, uh, ingesting a capsule, uh, uh, essentially bringing to the implanted uh, artificial pancreas a dose of insulin, so without injection. And uh, this is another uh, uh, idea of how this technology, uh, how controlling the, what happened in the body, swallowing and sending inside smart devices, uh, the robots, if you will, control could, could be. And the adventure continues because uh, miniaturization can lead uh, to uh, many, many new applications here. Uh, um, uh, uh, mentioning the convergence uh, of robotics and micro technology. So you see here uh, on this side of uh, the, the, the the, uh, this figure, robotic surgery, and uh, the quest for miniaturization. So, from uh, the Da Vinci to the capsule, and the smaller and smaller to millimeter or even uh, mesoscale, so sub millimeter or even micro and nanoscale. And here, uh, let's say the domain of uh, nanotechnologies, uh, uh, so nanoparticles, functionalized nano careers, smart structures, and in a sense, uh, uh, being integrated in uh, interventional platforms. So this uh, uh, vision of the future uh, has, of course, uh, many possible intermediate steps like this one. So capsules, for example, could uh, be equipped with uh, uh, or, or, or incorporate the nanofields that could be released. So essentially, the idea is to bring dedicated medications uh, inside even uh, the, the uh, vascular system, so creating a nano patch, and um, uh, or, or more can be done. Uh, cell and artificial structure could be integrated. This is also the work of another colleague and uh, my colleague Anna Machassi is about um, developing a living muscle cells, so creating a new new class of bioactuators. And uh, more and more, so magnetic micro-robots, magnetotactic bacteria, functionalized uh, uh, micro-structures, uh, nanoparticles that can lead uh, with different technologies and different ways of uh, uh, controlling to micro-robotics for medical applications. So, to conclude, uh, what next uh, after all these adventures, starting with the birth of robotics uh, and uh, going to get uh, going towards what is today the field of biorobotics and bionics, uh, engine science and engineering, as I try to show you. Well, extremely fascinating new frontiers, uh, 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 new uh, kind of human robots for uh, serving humans, for assisting humans, or wearable robots, or bionic humans, so uh, spare parts that uh, could substitute virtually all uh, parts of the uh, human body. Those are uh, outstanding opportunities and grand challenges. In fact, uh, uh, two years ago, and now we are coming back with a, with a new um, uh, special issue about the grand challenges uh, that uh, science robotics has identified. Uh, there were 10 grand challenges that we have identified. One is about the multifunctional materials. One is about the bio-inspired and bio-hybrid robots. Another big field is energy. Uh, we should always consider as engineers the importance of energy and efficiency. 
in uh, uh, these devices. Or uh, the field of what? Collaborative robots. If you think that 300,000 robots are currently in use by Amazon, to uh, for for their advanced logistics and many of them like swarm of robots swarm of workers uh, who, who collaborate but then also intelligent explorers for um, for for uh, uh, our world for example the depth of oceans or for uh, planets or social robotics so the interaction of these uh, artificial devices with us with us humans or brain Computer interfaces and medical robotics. I talked uh, uh, about those two uh, areas quite uh, quite a lot in, in my talk. But of course, there are a, a, a incredibly and fascinating new field to explore. And then, uh, but not then, actually, is central the role of ethical and security and uh, the implication of what we do of all these technologies on the uh, life of, uh, of us as uh, uh, humans. So, concerning medical robotics, uh, what's next? Uh, of course, the first of all is to make uh, these devices better. So, energy efficiency, novel design principle, multimodal uh, imaging, uh, uh, actuation, MRI compatible robots, new simulators, but also the uh, big grand challenge, the real grand challenge, that is uh, to move more and more as in our world, uh, as uh, if you will, like Industry 4.0, but of course more from wired to wireless. So to uh, uh, reach to what I call the hyper integration of micro, and nano components that are in fact uh, at the frontier of uh, of engineering. And, and with that, I'd like to thank you to acknowledge uh, the contribution of all my colleagues, uh, uh, the Institute of Biorobotics, uh, but of course, uh, many, many other uh, in the many laboratories I, I'm, I'm involved and participate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor. Paulo Dalio for an interesting talk just now. I feel that this one hour session is not enough to listen to this interesting talk. I know there are many more interesting findings uh, that can be shared with us. And I hope that uh, we can listen to uh, Professor Paulo Dalio talks again in the future talk, I hope. And from this uh, short session uh, talk, Professor Paulo Dario have uh, shared with us uh, many uh, uh, topics. Uh, for example, uh, biorobotics and bio uh, bionics. Uh, Professor Paulo Dario uh, shared uh, with us the evolutionary uh, progress from uh, 1960s until now uh, in robotics uh, field. Uh, he also shared with us uh, about uh, decentralized intelligence, uh, particularly in octopus. Uh, it is uh, very interesting to see how this artificial octopus can be used in many applications, uh, such as underwater drones, uh, laparoscopy in uh, medical uh, fields, and also in robotics uh, arms, where normally we have a rigid link manipulator which is uh, not safe uh, to human, uh, but by using this uh, octopus uh, light uh, link manipulator, it would be quite uh, safe uh, to humans. Uh, Professor Paulo Dario also shared with us uh, about a prosthetic arm, uh, particularly in cyber hand, bionic hands. And now we could uh, not only can control the bionic hand, now we can feel the sensations of this bionic hand. It's a quite interesting uh, progress in this field. And Professor Paulo Dario also shared with us with, uh, about colorectal uh, cancer, uh, particularly in capsule endoscopy, where he shared with us dreams where uh, we can go into human body and 
go to a specific location, particularly in a disease area, so that we can treat uh, that uh, disease. And, and finally, he also shared with us about micro nano uh, technology. And I know that the time is quite limited, uh, so we move on to a QA uh, session. All right, so, okay, we have one question from our uh, listener. Uh, what could the long term effects of colon capsules on the normal functions of the intestine and colon, such as erosions of the lining? Can the capsule move into the appendix? Professor. Very, very, very interesting question, actually. Well, uh, in most cases, the capsule um, examination is uh, relatively short, okay? It takes uh, like uh, uh, ideally 10 minutes, maximum 20 minutes. So um, I, I don't think, well, of course, we don't have enough experience, but uh, the, the, the experience is that colonoscopy is uh, not affecting uh, uh, the, the colon tissue at all. Actually. So we presume that also the capsule will not. Different is the case in which you want to do something, uh, I wouldn't say implantable, uh, for example, to control the microbiome or uh, doing other kind of uh, implanted operations. But I think, uh, actually, you know, uh, years ago, we started uh, with another approach. We explored another approach that I must say was not successful. That is uh, using uh, uh, legs, okay, micro legs. And uh, even in this case, uh, so the capsule was sort of climbing in the core. Actually, it's a very fascinating engineering problem because uh, the capsule uh, would walk in a deformable environment like rubber. And from engineering modeling, it is fascinating. Actually, we wrote many papers on that. Um, even in that case, uh, there were no damages uh, in uh, the, the linen of, uh, of the column. Uh, so uh, the answer is that one, uh, the, the Duration of the examination in general uh, is short, so there are no no damages really. Uh, even if uh, we want to do something uh, that is uh, slower and uh, can stay, I don't think that experimentally we should be too concerned about that. Uh, the appendix, well, in principle, yes, but uh, uh, actually, you know that. Uh, this can be one of the threats and one of the complications in colonoscopy are called diverticular. Sometimes there are lateral uh, channels okay, that have a dead end, like the appendix. And in a, a colonoscopy, this has to be avoided because it can be dangerous for the patient, can be for uh, create a perforation. So uh, we should not go there. But in principle, Yes, it would be possible to go there. I cannot hear you. All right. Thank you, Professor Paolo Dario. All right, for the answer. All right. Um, I would like to ask a general uh, questions. Uh, you shared with us uh, there are a process in research uh, from, you know, the uh, applications, uh, uh, missions or uh, dream or goals uh, from the modeling part, the analysis part, uh, from the, you know, the research activities, the, the verification, the validations, experimental works until we uh, conclude uh, the work. And I would like to ask you how we can speed up this uh, process because normally it will take uh, a long, long time to obtain uh, the results. So, do you have any uh, yes, suggestions? No, thank, you. thank you very much, Dr. Mod, because this is a real uh, fundamental question. You know, uh, yeah, you know. In general, the domain of uh, science and the domain of engineering are 
quite separated. You know, sometimes there is like a valley. I call them. It is known sometimes as the death valley between uh, uh, science and uh, market. Okay, and uh, many people are trying to accelerate this uh, transition. Um, and this is one of the key problems for innovation. Uh, okay, I can give you some answers. First of all, it is very important to connect these two banks of the valley. Okay, um, for example, just uh, today, in these days, um, the, the Royal Academy in Sweden is uh, uh, awarding the Nobel Prizes. Okay, so Nobel Prize are something that should not be remote from us. I'm very much interested in what uh, 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 the Nobel Prizes are discovering. So discoveries are a fundamental source of disruptive innovation. Because, you know, if, if we as engineers live on our, our bank just doing design, sometimes we don't have the, I would say, the element to create disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation comes mostly from science. You know, for example, I make the case of the blue LED. The blue LED was a discovery and uh, the entire field of lightning, of illumination was revolutionized by the discovery of the blue light, but also lithium ion batteries. Uh, the scientists who discovered the physical effect have been awarded the Nobel Prize. Like Robert Schock, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the physical effect leading to the transistor, or those who discovered the graphene, you know, that is referred. So there is a lot, really a lot of uh, insight for engineering that comes from science. So my first strong recommendation for good engineer, U UTM is an engineering school, I'm an engineer. So if we want to educate and to promote a disruptive innovation, we should encourage our students and also our research, not only to do good design, but to make inventions. There is a strong difference between design and invention. And there is a difference between invention and discovery. But invention, in many cases, can be inspired by discovery, so new knowledge. Then the second answer, so one, this is one, one answer. Second point is we should encourage our students to be brave, to be innovators, to think out of the box, to explore uh, new ideas, but not only to explore, but to encourage and prize and uh, uh, recognize the uh, innovators. Even in sometimes, you know, innovators are re rebels. Okay, the innovators are not well ordered people. If you consider the life and the story of people like uh, like uh, uh, Steve Jobs uh, or 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 actually even. Uh, uh, the Ma in, in the in the USA or Bezos or 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 Zuckerberg, you know those guys are not uh, normal people. Okay, and so I go to the third point and then I close. It's about the ecosystem. So you say, how can we accelerate? That's the real challenge. So first point is to uh, dig into science, so to dig into new knowledge. The second point is to educate innovators and not just the designers of existing uh, uh, devices. This, of course, can be good for incremental innovation. That is important. But if we want disruptive innovation, you need to educate innovators. And finally, you must create a receptive ecosystem that is uh, uh, able to encourage innovators, and of course, there is no 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 doubt that uh, the United States at this time, the Silicon Valley, so on, are the best ecosystem. Even if, of course, there are many other countries. Malaysia is one of those. Uh, 
that is are encouraging innovation but creating an ecosystem. Consider three C, three C that are used in Europe for uh, creating or defining the innovation ecosystem. We are working hard on that. One is competence. The first point. Competence is the key, okay? And this is what you said. It's our responsibility as professors to create competence. Uh, then the second point is uh, capital. But capital goes where the competence is. It's not through the contract. And the third is connectedness. So the ability to work together. This is why I'm, I'm a strong believer that my CV is a demonstration of that. Actually, we met to be new mod in, in Japan, in other countries. You know, it's a network. When we know each other, we work together. And, uh, you know, uh, collaboration is uh, one uh, is a key for uh, accelerating, in fact, the answer to your question, accelerating the uh, implementation and the realization of uh, uh, good ideas for the benefit of uh, the humankind uh, in, in different ways, satisfaction, uh, wealth, uh, uh, responsibility, and so on. So my answer is this. Thank you, Professor Pomodoyo, for good advice uh, to young researchers like us. And I still remember when I met uh, Professor Paolo Dario uh, 2010 back ago uh, at his uh, laboratory in Pisa, Italy. I was so amazed with uh, very wonderful research uh, at that time. Now, when I listen to his talk, so I'm double or triple amazed uh, with what he has achieved uh, so far. So thank you so much, uh, Paolo, Professor Paolo Dario, for your wonderful sharing talk. And I hope that uh, we could uh, listen more and more again from your talk again in the near future. And that's all. And uh, thank, you. thank you so much again. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Rizwan, for sharing the session. Uh, and thank you so much to our distinguished speaker today, Professor Paolo Dario, all the way from Pisa, Italy. Uh, you have shared lots of really amazing stuff. Amazing, amazing stuff there. Thank you so very much. Uh, it, it's uh, such a great achievement for you and your team. So congratulations on that. And uh, to all of you watching this uh, Distinguished Lecture Series, thank you so much for watching. Do stay tuned because we have many more lectures for you. Uh, until then, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.